um, we, we went down the corporate venturing route uh, for, for a whole raft of reasons. Um, and actually, I think, I'd love to say that um, it was strategic genius and I'm a, some sort of soothsayer, but I think particularly in the current climate, you're going to see more and more corporate venturing take place. The, the challenge for any small business um, that has grand ambitions is scale. So when, when you've got an idea, a concept that you're then trying to validate, that you're then trying to commercialize, that you're then trying to scale, is you, you have to have very patient shareholders. And you also, particularly if you're reliant on big customers, as we were, banks, mobile operators, government departments, you have to tick a lot of boxes um, from a procurement perspective. So you have lots of departments that say, is this company going to still be around in a year's time? Have they got a strong balance sheet? Um, you know, are they going to be able to scale to the ambition of our you know, tens of millions of customers? So when we, when we set up Monetize, even if we had raised you know, tens of millions of pounds, we still would have faced the challenge of being a startup with the sorts of co companies that we wanted to work with as, as customers and distribution partners. So where corporate venture really worked for us is uh, we were very lucky to, we went to see a, a number of companies, we were very lucky to meet a company called Morse and meet with their chief executive, Duncan McIntyre, and their chairman, Richard Lapthorne, who's the chairman of Cable and Wireless. And um, they you know, had looked at the, the corporate venturing incubation model a number of times. <clears throat> and we, we managed to do a deal between us where we became basically a subsidiary, an R&D department within Moors. But what it meant immediately to our customers was that we were no longer a startup. We were a part of a £300 million business. We were a PLC, so we had a you know, great, great uh, transparency. And it meant that we could go out and really sell the vision on, on that foundation. So it was good for us and, and because of what we do, which is obviously connect up these banks and mobile operators, it was essential. I don't think we would have got going without it. Interesting in the current climate, I think with the, the lack of capital, uh, you know, the risk averse nature of most investors at the moment, understandably, we are now probably looking at an opportunity for companies that have a strong balance sheet to pick up some very exciting niche technologies and embed them in what they do. So I, I do think to entrepreneurs that are looking at your site and reading your magazines and everything, you know, don't always discount. It's always got a bad name, corporate venturing, because no entrepreneur wants to be employee number 70,553 in a big organisation. But, but I think do look at it as a model. And if you can get the right DNA, if you can find a company that's going to let you be autonomous and, and breathe the oxygen you need to breathe and be creative, but put in place the constraints of, of pragmatism and process that you need to build any company, I think it's a good model and it was good for us. Being a public company, uh, and we're a small public company, we're aim listed, um, we're, we're pre-profit in, in financial services and technology. So, you know, are we ticking all the boxes of uh, immediate investment for most fund managers? Probably not. Uh, and we have to be realistic about that. So I think the public markets generically are facing a very tough time. But, but also, you know, good comes out of all bad. And, and I think one of the good things about um, the current climate is it really picks the wheat from the chaff. If you don't fundamentally believe in your business model and your strategy, you shouldn't be there in the first place. And I think what it is doing is filtering out a lot of businesses that have been able to uh, ride a capital wave, raise huge amounts of money without really any substance. So, yes, the recession makes it hard. I think people's behaviour changes. Um, I think the media have got a huge responsibility to just get a bit more balanced about it because we can talk ourselves into these environments as well. Um, from, from a fundamental day-to-day -day business perspective, it's actually got some positives for us as well as negatives. We, we, we run an outsourced service for banks and mobile operators. And, and one of the first things that happens in, in tough times is innovation budgets dry up. Um, you know, Certainly new ideas and new channels aren't high on the priority list as people retrench. And so the opportunity for us is to say, look, we'll take on a lot of that heavy lifting for you and we can then create longer term relationships with our customers. So perpetually positive, as I always am, um, you know, we see both sides. Various market to market. So we have uh, Platform Live in the UK, as you say, Money, Money Link is our service in the UK. It's a joint venture between ourselves and the ATM network, Vocalink. Um, and uh, we've, we've, we've had a good few years. We're connected to uh, nearly 60% of, of all the banks in the UK, all the mobile operators. We have hundreds of thousands of customers using the service, doing things like checking their balance, um, getting in the current climate alerts to tell you that you're near an overdraft limit or um, if you're overseas, great service that we offer is every time you use your bank card overseas, now you get a text message, which is great from a fraud perspective and peace of mind perspective um, that consumers get that sort of service. 
Then there's the, the, the sort of more um, payment related services. So people use our platform to top up their own or their kid's mobile phone, um, move money between accounts. So it's all very well texting someone to say you're near, near your overdraft limit. Well, thanks very much. Uh, but also we give them the ability to move money between accounts. So take money from savings, put it into your current account. And then recent, recently, um, we launched a service uh, for Polish workers in the UK through NatWest, where they can send money home using the mobile phone, which is great if you watch the, the, the Forex, you know, the foreign exchange rates quite closely, as a lot of these people do. It can make a big difference if you get the timing right to send the money home. Um, and then in the US, we have a service live in, in America as well. And there we have things like bill pay. So in the US, they don't have the same direct debit systems that we have in the UK. So everyone pays their bills sort of on, on the go each month. So we've launched a service where you get an alert to remind you your bills due and then allows you to pay it in the mobile in the mobile phone. So yeah, lots and lots of stuff, but still, you know, we're sort of right at the beginning of the journey, really. On, on the planet, there's 4 billion people that are unbanked just don't have a bank account. Well, some people might argue bank accounts are a bad thing at the moment, but they're not. You know, financial services, financial education is something that everyone benefits from. And, and there's all sorts of reasons why they don't, but bank infrastructure has never really reached the parts that, that uh, other technologies can reach for, for a whole raft of reasons. So we see the mobile and those four billion unbanked, two thirds of them live within walking distance of a phone mast. We see the mobile as being able to have a really big impact in, in that part of the world, whether that's for microfinance, so lending people money digitally through the, the, through the mobile phone for a cotton farm or for an agricultural loan, through to peer-to-peer -peer payments and cross-border remittances, the sort of thing I just talked about before. So we, we formed some partnerships in Africa, East Africa. We've got some government um, support and government funding to do that. Uh, we're forming partnerships in India. Uh, we're forming partnerships in other parts of the world where using our sort of more bank grade background of the UK and, and the US and, you know, billions of transactions a year type business and then trying to put that into a situ where the banks that only have an urban presence, so are only based in a city, can suddenly reach out to all of the rural environments with their bank brand, but over the mobile network. So we're, we're really excited about that. Time to think through each stage of the process is something that I think everyone, you know, really could do uh, with more of. One of the ways I've combated that, and um, you know, I'm very lucky to have them, is I've surrounded myself with great people and advisors. And I've got an advisory board as well as a PLC board who all have fiduciary responsibilities to protect, uh, you know, protect shareholder value. I have an advisory board of, of some real world leading experts, uh, you know, ex-president of Visa, um, CEO of Carphone Warehouse, people that have been hugely supportive and, and give me a different perspective and allow me to bounce ideas off them when I'm running at 100 miles an hour. And so, again, a bit of advice to anyone that's that's interested in uh, in your magazine or, or, or the website is, you know, get yourself people that have been there and done it. Incentivize them to support you. Get them to buy into what you do. And don't be afraid to listen to what they've got to say, because I can be damn sure they know more than you do.